Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Hi, and welcome to Reloscope, the Relationship Science Insights podcast produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. We are champions of life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week, we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element with the expert knowledge of professionals in the field. I'm Marie Stella, your host from Melbourne, Australia. Let's start the show. Welcome back to the show. Infidelity in any kind of romantic relationship is bound to sting. There are major decisions involved, whether it's calling it quits or letting bygones be bygones. And even then, the road to healing is long and tumultuous. So in this episode, we are speaking to Leah Wynn, a marriage and relationships counsellor, to find out what open and honest conversations can really do for a relationship that's already experienced some disloyalty and where couples can go from there. Hi, Leah. Lovely having you on the show. How are you doing today? I'm great. Thank you so much. Such an honor to be here. Uh, thank you so much for spending your time with us. So in your line of work, what's the most common problem clients come to you with? I would say I specialize in couples work and the biggest would be communication to people trying to get across what they're saying and landing the way they intend it for the other person. And then my yes, re- I, part of that. <laughs> Yes, I feel like that reflects off um, a lot of relationship issues that my friends have as well. Um, Now, that's a great preamble for our topic for today. But before we get further into detail, we'd like to get to know you better. This is Have You Met Leah Wynn. So what do you like to do in your spare time? Um, I love to keep active. So I swim, I run, um, I love cooking and baking. Um, spending time with my two kids so yeah that's a great way to um, just keep your body a bit more like feeling a bit more alive and it's always great to have a little bit of activity physical activity in there um, to brighten up your day Uh, do you read any books what's a what's a favorite of yours I love um, change your brain change your life by Dr. Amen. Um, what is it about? It's about your brain and how you can actually change your brain. We always, the, the old notion was that your brain stayed the same, but it's actually pretty flexible. And depending on certain activities that you do, you can change your brain. You can help your anxiety, you can help your depression. Uh, you can, by just doing certain activities and you know having certain healthy habits. Yeah, um, that's fascinating. Uh, what kind of films do you like? Well, you know, I'm a mom, so I don't really have time to watch movies. The most, I think the most recent one I watched was Elemental, which mm-hmm. I actually really loved. So that's completely fair. I feel like when my mom was raising me as a child and my mom um, has three kids. Uh, and so for like a good two decades she has only like almost exclusively been watching children's movies <laughs> um and it's kind of like it, it's a bit brain fogging sometimes but when she finds a children's movie that she likes it's like oh wow a pot of gold <laughs> um so do you listen to any podcasts i do um Actually, my husband really likes podcasts, so we'll listen. I, I'm a, again, I don't have a lot of time for a lot of things. So when we're doing road trips, he likes to listen to Conan. Conan needs a friend. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, so, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, Conan and Brian, right? Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, I've definitely seen that before. He is so funny. He's such a funny person. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, love him so much. Um, so who do you look up to? 
I look up to my mom. I th- I think a lot of people say that, but she is truly amazing. She was a single mom. She raised two kids on her own. She worked full time and wow. she never complained. She never talked about how we didn't have money. You know, she just always, even when she looks back now, she always says, you know, I, I, I was truly blessed. And so um, I always try to have the outlook in life, just be content wherever you're at in life. And I got that from my mom. That's impressive and so sweet. I think I'm going to start looking up to your mom. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing a bit about yourself. Uh, now we will delve a bit deeper into infidelity. So the first question that we like to ask everyone is, what is a relationship? How would you personally personally describe a relationship? Oh, that's a hard one. Um it's two people deciding to be in each other's lives, um, but I would say with shared expectations, maybe shared goals, um, maybe commitment is a part of that too. So you can have like a business relationship, you could have you know, a friendship, um, and then obviously what we're talking about now is romantic relationships. Absolutely. So in your opinion, um, does a romantic relationship still hold the same meaning, structure and importance as, let's say, 10 years ago? 10 years ago, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm older, so I feel like 10 years wasn't that much, but I can say like maybe 20 years ago, I feel like people were like if you got married in your 30s that was considered older because all of my friends were married in like late mid to early 20s and now I feel like that is being pushed further and further so a lot of clients that I see in my practice they're like 30 30 is kind of about the right time from what I've seen at least in my area which is the Bay Area in in California um, oh, I not- love California. Yeah, it's yeah. Brilliant. Love the Bay Area. The Bay Area is the best. Well, well, let's just um, very- sorry, <laughs> a little sidetrack. But yeah. Well, yeah. But um, um, everyone's kind of delaying marriage. They want to be stable. They want to be educated. It's really expensive to live here. So I'm seeing that push to, um, you know, just getting married later. Um, women are more career oriented. They're more okay with being single. I think when I was... In my 20s, it was like you had to be married. I think there's still some levels of stigma now, but I think it's a lot less because I think there's just much more openness to different ways of living and women are able to support themselves financially. Um, So, or it's expected, you know, for women to be educated. So it definitely has, I think, changed over the decades. Yeah, um, oddly enough, well, I'm not that old, I've been told. I'm 25. Um, But, (laughs) well, here's the thing. When I was 15, a a decade ago, I didn't think 25 was that young. Um, But that might be just like teenage, teenage um, ignorance. (laughs) <laughs> and so when I was like 15, I was thinking, oh, um, 24 is already kind of pushing it to for a time to get married. And now that I'm 25, I'm like, do I want to get married? It it feels like a like it's gonna cost me a lot of money. Um so I can't even really see it that much in my future, to be honest. Or maybe it has changed quite a bit. Um <laughs> so how would you define infidelity? Um, infidelity is these, yeah, these, these questions are, um, making me think, um, I would say it's when you break your promise to somebody else. And I would say there's also, cause I said like a relationship is an agreement between two people that has commitment. So infidelity would mean a break in that commitment or the expectation, the terms of the relationship. But I think on top of that, there's a layer of deception too. Yeah. Um, and specifically in romantic relationships, how would they be affected by an act of infidelity? I mean, it really will turn your life upside down. You know, I mean, I, I see lots of couples that struggle with infidelity and they say, and these are people that 
have, you know, some of them have already had significant trauma in their lives. They'll say this was the biggest trauma I've ever been through, right? So it really will turn your relationship and your life upside down. It will shake the very foundation of your relationship. And it, for a lot of people, it quest- they question, they, you know, they might be together for 20 years and then maybe year 20, they catch their spouse cheating they question the whole 20 years, right? So it will really make you question a lot of your relationship and it breaks the trust, right? So um, it's hard because these are, this is the person that's supposed to love and care for you the most and they end up betraying you. That's the hard part. It's not just some random person that you hate that's doing something to you. It's the person you love the most. Yeah, and you kind of want to... um why as well why has it happened and um is it something to do with you are you the problem is that the are you the reason that they broke their promise uh and so how do honest conversations help with addressing infidelity in a romantic relationship are you asking like how important is honesty is that what you're asking or well, yes. How important is it um, to have these honest conversations and how do they look like? What do they, what do they look yeah. like? You mean like honest conversations, like, tell me, did you cheat on that person, on me? Like that, that kind of honest conversation? Something or- like that. And for example, if someone has committed infidelity, what's the best way to initiate? an honest conversation like that? Well, I think first of all, you can't have a conversation if it's not honest, right? Because the very found, the very crux of infidelity is the deception, right? And lots of people will say, like, it's more painful that they lied than they actually did the thing, right? Um, the, the, the lying, the deception is often the most hurtful thing so oftentimes when I see clients, I off, you know, sometimes they'll come in, the cheater, I just call, can I call them the cheater? They'll yes. say, um, you know, I didn't do anything. I was just having lunch with her, right? And then you kind of get this feeling of like, I'm not sure if they're really telling the truth, right? Of course, mm-hmm. nobody will know except that person, right? And I always say to them, like, you know, we cannot move forward if you don't tell the truth. We cannot build or repair anything upon a lie, right? So I think that is imperative as a first step. And if they're going to continue to cover it up, then um, we just can't move forward, right? Yeah. And I know you mentioned that it can't really be a conversation if it's not honest, Um, but... For it to be effective as an honest conversation or dialogue, what are some elements that need to be taken into consideration? For example, what language should someone use um, in such a dialogue? Um, I mean, it always helps if if it's, a calm conversation, right? Um, Obviously, you're going to have a lot of emotions. So I tell people, don't expect the person that was cheated on to always be calm because they're feeling crazy inside. They're really feeling just so, so many emotions all at once, so much pain. So the way they're acting is the way that they're feeling inside. And I try to get the cheater to really have empathy about that and not expect that once it's out and once they're in therapy that it's just going to be all roses and healing right there's just so much pain in there that needs to come out obviously not for long periods of time but in the beginning crisis mode that's going to happen uh but i think if if you can be calm and not just raging mad the other person the cheater is going to be more likely to share what really happening, you know, um, versus if a person is yelling at you, you're just in defense mode, 
right? There's no way you, you're going to say whatever, right? You're, you're in panic, they're in panic. There's nothing that really can, um, for the best optimal conversation, you really want to try to get calm. And yeah, I think reassuring the other person too, um, which I don't want to put all the burden on the person that was cheated on to make the cheater feel safe. I think at the end of the day, the cheater needs to own up regardless of what the other person is feeling or if the other person is going to be mad. That's the work of the, the recovery, right? Is that the person that cheated has to have the courage to do the hard things. And that means being honest, even if the other person is going to be angry at them or going to be hurt or there's going to be shame there. So um, yeah, in a perfect world, a calm, calm listener but that's not always realistic, right? I think it has to be a decision on the person that cheated that says, I'm going to have courage and I'm going to do what's right, even though it's hard. And that means to be honest. Yeah, definitely. This all hits really, really close to home because I have been cheated on before. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, it, I did react with a lot of, anger and a lot of frustration and a lot of just really a lot of emotion maybe more than um what my ex could handle and I always I I got this whole thing of like or um I don't want to talk to you uh, when you're like this and it's kind of like what do you mean you don't want to talk to me when I'm like this like this is well how can you possibly be spinning this on me now and making it my fault um but what are some other challenges that couples go through when engaging in these conversations? How and how can they overcome them? Well, first of all, I just want to say I'm sorry that that oh, happens to you, right? And um, yeah, well, in in retrospect, I think it was a good thing because it did teach me well in the first place he wasn't a good partner so obviously um, (laughs) yeah well I didn't yeah I didn't have to do the hard work I guess of like figuring them that out when it's too late and then leaving him when it's too late and I've wasted too much time so I'm honestly kind of grateful for it still don't condone it but um, but thank you for saying sorry anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. <laughs> I love that you are able to see it with a positive lens and take away that you learned something from it. That's awesome. It's my coping mechanism. It's what keeps me going. It's a great one. <laughs> it's a good one. Therapy. Therapy works. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So what are some challenges that couples face when they have to engage in these conversations yeah I mean I think you said a very important one right is that the cheater expects the person that was cheated on to just feel better right like oh I've stopped the affair so now you need to just take me back and we just need to like start over right or we need to just move forward I hear that a lot I wish they could I wish you could just heal and we could move forward, right? And I and I say, you know, we can't for like maybe to you at this point where you stop the affair, that's when it's over. But for your partner, it just began, right? So yeah. we're not over. We are beginning, <laughs> right? And that's where I have to do a lot of education with my clients that um This is going to be a journey, right? It doesn't end when you stop the affair. It ends when the trust is rebuilt. So um, the expectation of when the person that was cheated on is going to heal and recover is, I think, a big misconception. The other one is the work that it takes. Sometimes people say, well, I said sorry already. I said sorry like three days in a row. Like what else does she want or what else does he want, right? It's like three days in a row of sorry is not going to build up tr- build up trust right you need there's so many more hurdles so much damage that was done that needs to be repaired so i think just giving people that cheat that perspective that this is going to be hard work and are you ready right and don't expect the other person to just come around right if you love the person you need to really build that trust back up again 
and do the work to do that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Also, because um, what they did wrong, it was in the form of action um, or a, a series of actions. And in trying to offset these actions with purely words is exactly. negating right. all of the trauma that you've just put onto this person. Wow. You're basically saying... I've said sorry, that should be enough for you to forget about what I've done Um, and completely invalidating um, whatever they they are feeling. Uh, So what can the cheater do instead of just saying sorry three days in a row? What can they do to help make this healing process a bit easier for their partner? Yeah, I mean, I think they need to, like I just said, understand that this is a journey we'll have to go through. This is not like, I just need to say sorry. This is like a journey that will last, you know, years, you know, a year, two years. It's not going to be as intense as time goes on, but don't expect it to be better in a week or even a month, right? There's so much rebuilding that needs to do, that needs to be done. I think, um, And like we said earlier, the honesty piece is really important. And then I would say um, be be ready for lots of questions, right? And be truthful about those questions. Um, There's going to be a lot of questions like, why did you do it? How could you do it? How could you let me down? Questions that you can't really answer, right? Um, but they need to be ready for those kinds of questions and be ready to answer, know what the person is really meaning by that. Because how could you do it? I don't know if there's even an answer for that. They're looking for an answer. And that's where I kind of help couples is to interpret what's happening, right? And to help the cheater give the, the person I was cheating on what what they need, right? Yeah. Um, And then I think the other thing is understanding that the anger, underneath the anger is pain, right? So they have to stop saying like, oh, my partner is overreacting. He or she is just acting crazy. Like see the pain underneath that. And when you can see the pain and empathize, I think you'll respond a lot better. Yeah, that's really great advice. And it sounds like a lot of the questions that you've um, given, like that you've mentioned, they sound like rhetorical questions and basically just the thought process um, for someone who's been cheated on. And they're just thinking out loud and you just really need to support them through it and be there for them emotionally and hear them out. Like, it's fine if you don't have an answer to it. You might not. Um, but um, you need to just support the person while they're thinking out loud, really. Something like um, someone says, how could you do it, right? She's He or she's just saying, I'm so hurt. You hurt me so much. So your response would be, I hurt you so much. I betrayed your trust, right? So it's not really an answer to how could you do it. You're just kind of reflecting what the person is thinking, right? What's underneath that question. And when someone says, how could you do it? They're thinking, I don't understand how you could do it. Um, They are verbalizing that um, confusion with how it happened. And it's not really... For you to answer like, oh, well, it was pretty easy. Because <laughs> you know? that, that's not good. Yeah, that's not I a good answer. Else, and then I, yeah. 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 Oh, well, like uh, I used VPN. Oh, I just switched <laughs> off my location on Snapchat. Wow. Like, no, that's not what they're asking. Exactly. <laughs> um, so every relationship is unique, obviously. And the healing process would vary from couple to couple. So when having these conversations, is it better for the cheetah to be brutally honest 
or sugarcoat it a bit. Like when they're confessing, is that what you're saying yes. to the offender? Yes. I mean, what does even brutal honesty and sugarcoating mean? I think you definitely don't want to withhold important information, right? So if you slept with somebody, don't say we had lunch and that's it, right? You obviously want to say the honest truth, right? I don't think that people are going to go to the point, I mean, I don't know if I should say this on my, but I don't think they're going to go to the, you can edit that. I don't think they're going to go to the point of like, we had this position, we had that position. They're not going to volunteer that information, <laughs> right? They're just not. Um, unless the person asks them, hey, I really need to know because this is important. And people do ask that because they they don't want to feel like they're left out of anything, right? They don't want to feel like they're in the dark with anything. Now, sh is that a question? Should they be asking? Like, how much should somebody that's been cheated on, how much should they ask, right? I think you need to be careful because sometimes knowing too much can be hurtful, right? But I know that some people, they feel so anxious and unsafe in their relationship. Sometimes to feel a sense of control, they do ask a lot because they need to have that sense of like, the more I know, the more control I have over the situation. But um, sometimes it is more hurtful to, to the person hearing it, right? So I don't know, to answer the question, the cheater should be honest. They should be straight up like, hey, I, I went, you know, I slept with that prostitute, right? There's no sugarcoating that. Um, and, you know, I don't think they need to go into detail unless it's really necessary. Mm -hmm. Or maybe if it's asked. Yeah. But even yeah. then, if it's asked, they might just be looking for more reason to be angry, which maybe it's a valid part of the process. And in that case, yeah. So communication styles vary between individuals. Are there recommended practices or techniques that couples can adopt for these conversations to ensure that they are productive and beneficial? Yeah, I mean, I would say like I see them in different cycles, right? So like the first cycle or I don't know what you want to call it, like the first period is like when the affair first comes out, right? You're in crisis mode, like emotions are wild, like you're feeling everything, you're you're, you're rage mad and then the, the cheater is full of shame. Um, you know, they're struggling to tell the whole truth. I think during that time, there's not really an expectation, right? We just need to get it out, right? And the person that's been cheated on needs, they just, they, they're angry, right? And so I often tell my clients that that's the best time to go to therapy because so much can happen, so much damage can happen during that time and both people are in panic mode, you can make a lot of mistakes or make it have a lot of damage done, right? Because everyone's just trying to protect themselves, protect the relationship, you know, be guarded. You know, it's just, it's just a really tough time, right? I think when you get to a more stable place, right, the next phase or cycle, the next phase that you go into is, and that's if the person, the cheater has been honest, has been empathetic, um, has really made the efforts to build trust. So like a lot of my clients, they really wanna know where their where their spouse is, right? They wanna have the, um, this, you know, the app that tell the GPS, right? Um, I say, if you have nothing to hide, let your spouse know, right? Because it will build trust, right? Or they wanna have access to all of their phones and their computers. Hey, if you've got nothing to hide, do it, build that trust, right? So. If they're doing those things and not being resistant, because I do see that too, where the spouse is like, I want my privacy and, you know, I feel so um, suffocated by you. It's going to be really hard to get to the next phase, right? So if there's honesty and there's action and there's remorse and there's empathy, you go into the next phase. And that's where I tell my clients, the one that's been cheated on, like, 
try to work on sharing what's really happening inside, right? What's really happening underneath that anger, right? Try to get to a calm place, see a therapist, try to share more of the pain than the anger, right? Because you can see that your spouse is making an effort. They're doing the hard work. Um, you know, try to let down a little bit of your guard as much as trust as they built, right? So if they built no trust, obviously you're not going to let down any of your guard, but the more trust they've built, let down your guard a little bit more, show some vulnerability, show the pain. You don't have to protect yourself with the anger anymore. Right. And then I add the uh, person that cheated to really, again, empathy, right. Understand and, um, just care and support. That's great advice. And my God, your voice with all of that advice just put me into this very soothing mode and make me feel so calm about a very heavy subject, infidelity. <laughs> um, what other pieces of advice or encouragement maybe would you give to couples who are beginning this journey of confronting infidelity? I would say don't feel like you have to do it on your own. I mean, um, it, it there's so many things to navigate and the more committed you are, like if you're married versus if you just started dating a person, right? Like it's different, but um, it doesn't, and it doesn't have to be a therapist. Obviously I'm, you know, I, I think that I've helped a lot of people navigate that crisis time. But even if it's like, you know, um, somebody that you trust that has some influence or wisdom, you know, a, a good friend that you know has your best interests at heart, try to get some support as much as you can. Um, and then, yeah, the, again, like I've been saying, we've, been, we've both been saying over and over again, the honesty piece and the effort, I think. The I always tell the cheater, you're going to have to to build trust. It's not going to be your day to day status quo, right? Your life is going to it's upside the, your your partner's life has turned upside down, right? So in order to build the trust, you're going to have to turn your life a little. You're going to have to bend a little bit, right? Bend over backwards a little bit, right? To to rebuild that trust. So don't feel like I can just go on status quo. Like understand there's work that needs to be done and be willing to do that if this relationship is really worth it. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, those are some words of wisdom right there. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, now we'll go on to some questions from the audience. Uh, how can someone differentiate between a one-time mistake and a pattern of infidelity in a relationship? Oh, it's a good question. Like if that person has only cheated once, how do you know if this is going to be a pattern or if it's one time? Yes. Um, It's hard to tell, right? But it is. You, but you can look at the context, right? Um, And this may be obvious, but you see a lot of people that you kind of know they have a propensity for cheating. One is if they have a history of it, right? So if they cheated on their ex and then they cheated on you, there's good chance that they're going to do it again, right? Um, we don't know, but you know, if they've never cheated ever and then they had a traumatic experience and they were just in this really dark place and they cheated, that's, that's different, right? Um, if they, if you can already see little inklings of cheating, like, you know, social media, they're like flirting over social media there. They've got um, like a lack of boundaries, right? That is, you know, that coupled with cheating, I think is oftentimes a red flag, right? That it's, it could happen again. So I think you just have to look for the clues and yeah. um, don't let, you know, ask I think sometimes people around you your friends and your family they're the eyes and ears that sometimes we don't have when we're in love or we're just like we really want something to work or we're, we're feeling rejected because they cheated on us and we're feeling like I really want to make this work otherwise 
the affair partner has won, she's won him over or he's won her over. Um, a lot of times we don't see clearly during that time. Mm, totally. And I I feel like your friends and family are the best way to tell if um, your the partner in question is a red flag or not. I oftentimes find that if I'm withholding information about my partner for whatever reason, because I think my family and friends will think badly of the relationship or disapprove of it. More often than not, there's a reason why. And um, so maybe that's something to think about. And obviously I'm not talking about like secrets, like their dark secrets that I withhold from my family and friends, but more of like things about his character, um, things that reflect on what he might do in the future. Oftentimes there's a reason for that <laughs> i love that so, yeah yeah i love that just In, mindful of things like your own motivations like oh wow i don't really want to tell my friends or family that because it is a red flag right <laughs> and to go back on that and and be, be honest with yourself about what's happening right it's hard to do though love is blind really i mean it Our is so blind. Hard, right? Because we need that love when we're like caring for children and they annoy you and they're, you know, we need that love to keep com being committed to our spouses when they, you know, don't put the toilet seat down or, you know, they, mm -hmm. you know we, need, we need that, that, that love, right? I think that serves us well in certain situations, but it doesn't serve us well when it's a toxic situation. And that's where... Mm -hmm. We need to use our head sometimes. Yeah. Um, and in what case would forgiveness not be the best option after infidelity? And how do you determine if it's worth working through the issue? Yeah, I mean, I think forgiveness and trust are two different things. I think you should forgive no matter what. Obviously not right away, but I think we should all be on a journey of forgiveness with everyone with all of our hurts, right? And it's not for them, right? It's it's for us to have that freedom and to not let it have power over us. But trust is different, right? And trust is when the other person has really made an effort to rebuild that again, right? So I think you only you know when you're ready to let it go, when you're ready to trust again. And again, I think it you know, how, how much are they willing to rebuild is how much, how, how much they're willing to build that trust is how much you're willing to trust again. Right. And yeah. so I do have some clients where it'll be like two years and they're still holding on to it, even though the, you know, the, you know, was, it was like a one-time thing, right? Not that that's good, but it was a one-time thing. They were very new in the relationship and, um, I encourage that person, hey, it's been two years, they're very sorry, they've shown you all of these things, they've done A to Z. I'm, I didn't really tell them they needed to, for, like, to move on and trust, but I did say, what's keeping you from that, right? And let that be a source of um, like something we dig into and explore, right? Because I never want to tell someone, you need to move forward because that's that's up to them. Yeah. Right? But I think if it's time and everyone agrees it's time, there's some kind of barrier. And that's mm -hmm. where I think the work of a therapist can really help somebody dive into that if they're ready. Yeah, uh, that's a really good way of putting it because telling someone who has being scarred emotionally by infidelity hey you need to move on now without asking what's going on why aren't you thinking about moving on is everything okay um doing that i feel like just makes it worse because you're essentially telling them like it's like there's nothing you're, you're essentially telling them that their feelings aren't valid anymore and they should just forget about it when their process might not be over 
Um, and if there's something holding them back, that's completely valid too. And it's something to look into. So that's a really great way of putting it. Um, and thank you so much for sharing that with us. Now we're moving on to open mic. This is your chance to talk about anything that you're passionate about that doesn't have to be related to the topic. So take it away. The floor is yours. What am I passionate about? I'm passionate about what I do. I'm passionate about my company. That's amazing. That I work with. Yeah. That's what I'm passionate about. Uh, my husband. So, uh-huh. yeah. well, my husband is oh, also a marriage mm-hmm. coach and a lot of my, um, a lot of the advice I give to my couples is based on what I've seen him do. Honestly, he's oh, yeah, and he's a great. <gasps> so, That's so sweet. Uh, so, um, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Well, is there uh is there a most memorable story you have from your experience as a counselor? Is there a story that? strikes a chord with you in particular and that you remember very well oh there's so many I mean I can't I wish I could tell I wish I could tell them all there's I mean it's like that's what I love what I do because you hear the story yeah. right mm-hmm. um it's it's up and down right like you hear sometimes you get so disappointed because you see the way somebody is has chosen to live, right? And, um, but then you also feel so encouraged too. You feel heartwarmed when you see two people working to make it, you know, to repair and rebuild. And they do it, they do the hard work. It's blood, sweat, and tears, but they do it and they come out stronger than before. And some of them might even, kind of like you said, right? Some of them might even say, I'm really like grateful that this happened right not everyone says that because right? it, yeah. it's traumatizing for sure but there's a rare there's a rare few that say you know our relationship came out stronger than ever so. yeah that's always nice to hear i personally didn't take the cheating incident well at all obviously like there's a process to it like you said um but definitely after a bit of healing and self-reflection and just working on myself personally, look looking back, it was a very good thing that it happened. And I really hope that everyone out there at some point, if they've been through this, I hope that they find that point in the healing process. Um, and I hope that it doesn't take too long because that will be agonizing. <laughs> it's hard. It's like a trauma. You know, what do you, you can't. And, yeah. and by the way, you said I didn't take it well. I don't think there's a, there's a well and not well way to take it. Right. You got through it. To me, you took it well. Right. Oh, thank you. There's no well <laughs> or not well. Right. Yeah. Um, it's like. This is why you're the expert. <laughs> you get in a car accident. Oh, there's no, like, you took that car accident well. Like, no, like, you're in a car accident, right? It's not well, right? No well, yeah, that. it's just you took the car accident. That's it. That's it, right? It. Yeah. You took yeah. it. You survived it. So, hey, mm-hmm. see? that's well. That's so true. Thank you so much, Leah, for joining us today. If our listeners want to find out more about you and what you do, where can they go? Uh, they can go to my website at leahwen.com. I also have YouTube and Instagram um, and Facebook. Yeah, so. All right, amazing. We'll link those in the show notes, including Uh Thank you, everyone, for tuning in and we'll catch you in the next episode. You've been listening to Veloscope, the Relationship Science Insights podcast produced by LMSL, the Live Management Science Labs. For more episodes like this from 10 different life management perspectives, search LMSL on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts so you can get updated on everything we have to offer. We have a wide range of topics readily available for you to check out. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider rating our show, sharing it, and subscribing to our channel as it helps us grow and bring you more quality resources. 
More of our work can be found on our website at re.lmsl.net where you can join our movement. I'm Marie Stella. Thanks for tuning in.